Welcome to Hedge Fund Tips with Tom Hayes. I'm Tom Hayes, and this is your 225th videocast podcast for the week ending February 8th, 2024. Uh, as the old saying goes, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Uh, what a day. Uh, the good news, Mrs. Lincoln, is Disney was up 11.5%. The bad news is, uh, Mrs. Lincoln, PayPal was down 11.5%. Other than that, how was the play? We're going to go into those names and a bunch of others. But first, as always, we'll start with some family updates. Want to congratulate Mimi and Annabelle. Uh, Mimi, they are both now one semester ahead. Mimi's 11. She's starting seventh grade this week. Uh, she's in a special program called the Academy at Laurel Springs, which is kind of like the honors advance. So very proud of her. Uh, and Annabelle is starting fifth grade at age nine. Uh, so we're really exciting. And when she gets a little older, she can apply for the Academy as well. So uh, pretty cool stuff on that front. Well done. And then I uh, want to thank Zahir Kachwala for including me in his article on Reuters today. Um, and then uh, a note here uh, from my buddy, thanks Adam, uh, from Bank of America talks about the tide turning for stock picking. And they're talking about just as active share plummets to decade lows, fewer eyeballs, more alpha, meaning there's less sell side coverage, which creates more alpha opportunities for people who do the work, um, screens for better breath, et cetera. And then they go through how passive inflows are slowing, how uh, free fee compression is slowing and fees are starting to go back up, um, uh, how there are fewer number of stocks available uh, in the S&P 500, which, by the way, is going to precede a monster IPO boom in the next few years. And the big banks are going to be monster beneficiaries. So every time I look at, wow, our city, Citibank and our uh, Bank of America have really taken off the last handful of weeks, uh, it's, it's literally just the beginning. So, yeah, they might pull back here for a little bit. There'll be commercial uh, real estate headline noise and nonsense, which is just going to be another extend and pretend. Um, but you want to hold those because when that IPO game uh, picks up and we get the issuance back up like we did from 95 to 99, we are going to see them mint money. And those are the two cheapest, decent quality, certainly Bank of America, high quality. But when the IPO boom come back, City really has a robust team there that can benefit like they did in the late 90s. Um, so those are some of the uh, some of the charts there. Next, uh, thanks to my buddies over at RBC. This is Slumer's takes just to give you an idea on the big picture. While everyone's debating, are we going to get our little five to seven percent pullback in the next few weeks? And look, it feels like it. We are a little bit overbought. But I got to say, I spent, you know, half the weekend uh, looking for stocks to short. And um, I got to say, I found so many more stocks to buy than I did stocks to short. And what that tells me is, yes, the indices keep plowing higher on a few of these AI kind of names that, uh, that have been driving the bus here the last few weeks. Um, breath has been a little bit narrow, but starting to pick back up. I do think there's, there could potentially, in the next couple of weeks, be some gas in the tank where the indices you know, pop up of 5,000, and but but then, uh, those bigger names slow down a little bit. So maybe we get two or 3% more. And then some of the other names under the surface start to play. Because even when I started to look across our portfolio, like what is near full value that I would be willing to sell? The answer was nothing. Um, uh, would there some that I would consider trimming or selling calls against? Maybe, but I'd be really pissed if they got called away from me because I want to own them for a lot longer. Uh, so it was kind of like, all right, can I find a few tactical shorts? And then I started thinking, you know, a lot of smart people in the market have this exact same idea in mind. And if you recall, uh, in at the turn of the new year, when everyone said, get short right away, people are going to be selling hand over fist. And we're like, nah, don't get too cute with this. We're just breaking out of two years of no gains. This thing can push a little higher. I'm, I'm still kind of in that camp. I do... I don't think there's anything to really harvest that I want to be out of now. There's a lot of things I want to, you know, today we did we did a ton of buying the last two days. We bought a ton of VF Corp yesterday. We bought a ton of PayPal today on the dip. Um, so 
you know, I, um, uh, <laughs> we have the hair of Alibaba, of course, we just can't help ourselves. We're uh, uh, Alibaba addicts. Uh, what, what's the saying? Uh, I'm, I'm Tom Hayes and I'm a Babaholic. But, um, uh, and then, um, so look, we got the big inflation prints next week. So if we run hard into that and volatility gets really, really compressed, maybe we'll put on some hedges just for the short to, to temper the short term volatility. But my inclination is this is a high single digits, low double digits year. Um, I'd rather just kind of wade through rather than get great companies called away from me if I start selling premium against it. Um, there are a couple tactical shorts we might take, or we might even just take the general indices if volatility gets compressed low enough and put some, maybe put some, uh, put spreads on or something along those lines. But stepping back to the scheme of things, like I said, we're halfway through a secular cycle that broke out in 2013. Uh, we've gone over this many single, many times. Um, and that would imply S and P 14,000 if the last two secular bulls are anything like this one. And that's on the low end. Uh, and we're at 5,000, so we're not even halfway through. The most amount of money in the shortest period of time in history is going to be made, I believe, in the next uh, 10, 9, 8, 9, 10 years based on the millennial boom. And then after that, it's going to be tough road, road for a couple of decades, just like we saw from 2000 to 2015, like we saw from um, uh, 66 to 82, and like we saw, of course, from 20. 9 to 48, uh, give, or, give or take, uh, where it'll be, you know, uh, more difficult to make gains. And there may, there may be a lot more opportunities on the short side, but we're, we're not even halfway there yet. So 10 and 20% pullbacks are to be bought. I think in the case of this year, I think we're going to be more like less than 10% pullbacks because we've just had two years with major pullbacks. Um, and then, um, uh, here we've gone through that, but but again, this is something that I continue to cover. Uh, we covered in more detail in recent weeks, so you can go back to those notes. But you know, you're breaking out of a two-year consolidation. The inclination and the measured move is is uh, whatever this was, thirty-seven hundred to forty-eight hundred, another eleven 1 hundred points, fifty-six, fifty-seven hundred. That's not going to happen in twenty twenty-four, but by the end of twenty twenty-five, twenty twenty-six. That's a reasonable target. So I could easily see us getting to 5,100 uh, before I, I start to really white knuckle it and look for, you know, what can I really take off here for a 5 to 7% pullback. Um, but uh, I just, again, I wouldn't get too cute. I do agree. I see everything everyone else sees. But the problem is, is everyone else sees it. And when everyone is so smart that we're getting a 5 to 7% pullback and getting out on Twitter saying, I went short today because they want to call the mini correction. It, it could be correct because, you know, going into August 1st of last year, we saw it coming as well. Uh, and, but it, and it was obvious and everyone saw it coming and it actually came. But who cares? It was 10%. And by the end of the year, if you had played that game and, and then you missed getting back, you missed the biggest move uh, in the shortest period of time from October till now was, was monstrous. Um, the other thing is when I was looking through to find a ton of, sh to find shorts and I was only finding, uh, longs is that, um, if you zoom out, so many of these companies haven't yet started to participate. So their earnings are growing, their cash flows are growing, their revenues are growing, but they're not, the, the price is not moving. So the weighing machine is not kicking in. The voting machine is, I just want AI and I'm going to chase NVIDIA because trees grow to the sky. Um, I, 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 I think those trees are going to prove to be need a little pruning and uh, the ones that are have consistent durable cash flows that haven't got, gotten rewarded yet are going to be uh, excessively rewarded in the next 12 to 24 months. So those are not the ones I really want to trim. This dollar chart from Slumer, I like uh, it show, you know, shows these counter trend bounces and that will resume the downtrend. I agree that's going to be helpful for emerging markets. Uh, Canadian dollar, again, came up against resistance. All these currencies against the dollar, I want to be long. Uh, gold, I have no opinion, but if I had to, like, gun to my head, uh, it looks like it's probably starting to break out, and that would be consistent with a, a, a weaker dollar. The sector cycles, uh, we're kind of at the stage here where we want to be getting into small caps, uh, financials, and then these emerging markets, currencies, and China. 
uh, and then some natural gas, which we've, we've talked about uh, Comstock resources in the last few weeks. I think that thing is ready to turn hard uh, in coming weeks. So we're excited about that. And that's irrespective of a five to 7% pullback in the market, which everyone's expecting. So um, same thing here with industry group cycles. So REITs, we were on that last year. Biotech is starting to move, um, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, helpful big picture thing over there. Then uh, as far as the economy go, Korean exports uh, pointing to a recovery. They're turning up. They're a leading indicator. We covered the freight uh, rail freight car load. This is all from Bank of America, by the way. And we are now in a restocking cycle. Remember, like 60% of the positions in our portfolio were, were on the basis that inventories uh, peaked in uh, first quarter of 2023, uh, whether it was Intel, Generac, Stanley Black & Decker, it was all the exact same thesis. And now the restock stocking game begins and that's where we make our money. And this is in early stages, just like you saw in mid 2009. And uh, after the COVID lows in late 2020, when everyone was waiting to go back and retest the lows and the market just kept going up, it feels similar. It's, it has that 2013 feel, the 2016 feel after the trouble and everyone was stuck in, you know, <clears throat> their mind was just stuck in, in the uh, recency bias of this because all this bad stuff has recently happened, therefore bad stuff continues to happen. And they forget about what happens when you get out of bad stuff, you tend to push higher and you get these little fake outs. Maybe we'll get another more fake out here before we get this long push, multi-year push. Um, but um, again, I wouldn't get too cute. Now you would say, why are you showing me these squiggly lines? You don't really care about technical analysis. And the answer is that's true. Um, but what I am seeing is what I said on Charles Payne's show in November and December, which is the thing that no one's paying attention to is margins are re-accelerating. And we're seeing that in spades with this earnings season and that's gonna continue. So for everyone says we're trading at 20 times, I think they're gonna be surprised that um, the, the E starts to go up uh, against all expectations and that P, uh, PE looks better. And then if you remove um, magnificent six or seven or eight or whatever the hell you want to call it, uh, the remainder of the market is like 15, 16 times, which is too cheap uh, relative to where we are in the cycle. So uh, some of these regular indicators for those of you wondering if the market's going to correct tomorrow or if it's going to be two weeks from now or two minutes from now, I really could care less. I own great businesses and all of them are still undervalued. Some of them have moved a lot and they're still undervalued, but um, there's none that we really want to harvest uh, here. I mean, could we could we sell Amazon that were up, uh, I don't know what that is, we bought in October lows and Google and hope to buy them back 20 points lower, I guess, but like, why would we do that and pay taxes? It makes zero sense. So even in non-taxable, like getting that perfect and then it runs 10 points away from you. And then all these people that are so certain we're getting the 5 to 7% correction, they were so certain 5% ago. So. Now they're five to 7% upside down on their shorts and their puts and all this stuff that they announced on Twitter. What if we go up another five to 7% before we have that 7% correction, then you're screwed. So as I've been saying for two months, don't get too cute with it. The, the trend is your friend in this case. Um, some of these things are certainly overdone as we're looking at these, these different indicators but not all of them are at extreme levels. Um, and the one that I like to look at quite a bit is the uh, PMO by all. Um, and this is at uh, 43, because as I said, it's you know not all the stocks are participating yet. If this gets to 100 and gets pinned and we're at like 5,100, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna find a way to get some short-term tactical hedges on, but I think it's just too cute. PMO by uh, DJ uh, Dow Jones, same thing. It's mid range. It's not at an extreme. PMO by SPX. What is PMO? It's useless, but it, it's just like when the 50 crosses the 200. I don't really care about that. It's just indicative of extremes that I just want to kind of pay attention to at certain points in the market like this, where you should be getting a pullback and 
if you're really experienced, you realize there may be a reason why you're not going to, particularly when everyone's so sure it's coming imminently. Um, so anyway, just wanted to go through some of these. I don't want to spend an hour on these. VIX is compressed. Everyone's going to say, oh, it's going to shoot right up anytime it gets that low, except, you know, 2016 to 2018, it just kept going lower and lower and lower and lower until it doesn't. But, um, you know, get a, a crystal ball if you're interested in predicting three to 5% moves. I mean, just buy good businesses when you've got a huge margin of safety and then the general market, you just wade through low leverage. You don't get knocked out. Business keeps growing revenues, cash flow. It doesn't pay attention to the Dow Jones. It pays attention to delivering value to consumers and generating cash for the owners. And that's what you want to focus on. By sector, com even communication services is not at an extreme overbought, according to the bullish percent yeah, percentage of stocks on bullish percent signals, which is a point and figure, which I have no idea how it works. But in aggregate, it does work just to show you when one sector is a bit overbought. And they're not really at extremes. And energy looks like some opportunity, which is why we're in Comstock Resources, uh, even though we don't like a lot of the EMPs because they've already had their huge moves. We liked them in 2020, and we liked getting out of them when everyone got excited in 2022. Uh, healthcare's had a move up. Maybe it's backing off. Maybe it's reloading to, to get to an extreme. Uh, but yeah, these are closer to the top than the bottom, so you could get that pullback. But on balance, materials, kind of mid-range, you know, they're just conflicting. The odds are skewed. If someone said, where's the pain trade today? Um, I'd probably say the pain trade is down. But the, the, I, I would say the equal pain trade would be up another 3%. Because everyone's, everyone's kind of expecting down right now because it, all the indicators are pointing in that direction. So it, that's why I don't really care. I own great businesses. If we go down five or seven percent, we go without tactical hedges. Uh, I could care less. I mean, uh, we don't run a lot of leverage. We'll be able to buy some stock down, uh, and and that's the way it goes. Okay, the article of the week is Vans also rans stock market and sentiment results. And for those of you who haven't read this yet, because I'm going to just gloss through it. Um, you do want to read it and you want to pay extra close attention to the area, the section of the article entitled How the Weighing Machine Works. Uh, and for those of you who've been listening for a while, you may think you know what that section is going to be about and you do to some degree, but there's going to be some new nuance that's going to open your eyes uh, to something that could be very valuable to you prospectively. Here's the article. Now, uh, the first picture here is a Google Trends picture of Vans New School, which is a type of sneaker that they have. And you can see the interest in the last 24 months has gone off the charts from zero to 95 in 24 months, okay? So while most people uh, brag about their winners and hide their losers, we spend 80% of our time on the positions that have not yet moved towards fair value and 20% of the time on the ones that are working great. Now, we will not cover recent successful earnings results from Baxter, Citibank, Bank of America, Estee Lauder, Canada Goose, Crown Castle uh, this week because they're all winning. Uh, Disney was a monster today. That was a nice beat as well. So we're not going to spend much time on that either, despite the fact we've been pounding the table on Disney for the last three weeks. And it was nice to see that play out. Um, but as exciting as Disney was, I was more exciting, more excited about the fact that the market gave us an opportunity to buy more PayPal in the mid fifties today, which was just a gift from God. Um, especially with what they said on the earnings call, which boggles the mind uh, how exciting that was and how the market didn't get it. But that's perfectly okay in the short term. The market is a voting machine based on emotions. Uh, and in the long term, it's a weighing machine based on fundamentals. So we'll talk about that. But VF Corp, this chart here, we always say to zoom out and you can see uh, in terms of price, we are at a level of extreme that we usually see massive recoveries from. In other words, despondency has kicked in and there are no sellers left. And then you get these type of big rallies off of these levels of RSI. And again, 
I could care less about technicals. I really could. But it gives uh, people that don't understand the fundamentals quite so well some semblance of historic precedent to say, okay, maybe it's at or as or near as bad as it's going to get in terms of price, the voting machine based on emotions. So now I can focus on the weighing machine based on fundamentals. And at these levels, that's when you start to get recovery. And we have started to get recovery off the $12.70 late last year when we were out uh, publicly talking about the stock. And, um, um, and now we do a little retest to shake out the weak hands and then we're back off to the races. So this is what that looks like. It's been in this trading range since January of 2020, I'm sorry, June of 2023. So about six, seven months now. Uh, and, and it scared people last night going under 15. And I think today it's back up to 1550. So it's back in the box. It's at the low end of the box. When we get up to 20, it's going to bang up against this box forever. Probably come back to 18, back to 20, bang up against the box. And then when it finally comes out of the box, then it'll be off to the races. And what, what is that catalyst? We don't know, but uh, we're going to cover some of the things that are happening under the surface. So we came out with VF Corp publicly on Fox Business, the claim and countdown on November 7th. You can watch this video here. I think it was trading at 15 and change that day, and it's trading at 15 and change today. So it's done nothing over that two-month period. And um, while it's unequivocal that VF Corp is under pressure, i.e. eyes wide open as we purchased it, 83% off of its all-time high and added more after earnings, uh, there is still a, a core base for Bracken Darrell, the new CEO, to turn around just like he did at Logitech. So this right here in the table above, I've listed the quarterly revenues for the last three years. What you essentially have is a steady state, flattish business that does three about $3 billion of revenue per quarter. That's this green line. Okay, sometimes a little bit above, sometimes a little bit below. Not really growing um, uh, per quarter. The exceptions are two of the 12 quarters we're Q4 2022 and Q4 2023. The rule is closer to what we saw this quarter, around $3 billion. Uh, you could argue that this quarter was a holiday quarter, and it should have been another exception. I generally agree, but the point I'm making is that there is a strong base for Bracken to turn around, and it is not, quote, falling off a cliff, as the percentage drop related to abnormally high comps suggests to the un critical eye. So as a refresher, you know, it, it's like all your point of reference, right? It, you know, if you look uh, two quarters ago, the revenues were barely $2 billion. Now they're at, at 3 billion. So you could say in just two quarters, our revenues are up 50%. Well, that also wouldn't be a fair comparison because that's that's not the strongest period uh, uh, quarter of the year. Um, just as saying that revenues down 16% is the business falling off a cliff. A lot of these revenues are, were pushed forward. This was the peak of vans in 2022, if you remember. And a lot of these revenues were pushed forward into this. So this should have been like three, what was that? Three, five, it should have probably been three, two, in which case revenues would have been down 8%. And considering that the, 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 the van cycle peaked back then, uh, that would be completely understandable. But 16%, everyone's like, oh my God, the end, the end of the world. All right. So as a refresher, Daryl Bracken, the new CEO, entered a fading brand, quote, commodity business called Logitech in January of 2013. That's this line right here, ladies and gentlemen. The stock was also down 82%. That seems to be the magic number for all the stocks I like to buy, whether PayPal, whether... Uh, 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 Baba, whether um, uh, VF Corp, whatever. Uh, over the next eight and a half years, not minutes, not weeks, not months, not even quarters, the stock was up 2,600%. So in English, that means you put in a million bucks when Bracken became CEO. Guess what? The stock went against you in the short term. And in the long term, you turned that million bucks into 26 million bucks. So, and by the way, Okay, and by the way, the stock went down for a little while after he took took the helm before it started turning around. 
Um, you can barely see it on the chart, just like you're barely going to be able to see the VF Corp spike down yesterday on the chart when we look back in a year, but um, that's all people can see in the short term. As you can see in the header photo, photo, the company is refocusing on young consumers in their new school shoe, which has been a huge hit among children. They look like the classics, but the trademark is puffed out. This little wavy line is like 3D. It's pretty cool. I wouldn't wear those, but I showed you the ones I bought last week, which are called uh, low, Lowlands, which are really cool. I wore them to paddle this week, got a lot of compliments. Um, anyway, the number one analysis you do when entering a major turnaround situation is solvency risk. So as long as they're generating sufficient free cash flow to buy them enough time to turn the corner, you're simply playing the time arbitrage game, so long as you have a good jockey. And in Daryl Bracken, we have that in spades. VF Corp reaffirmed its free cash flow guidance at $600 million for fiscal 2024 on the quarter. So that means that last year was the turnaround. Now they've got another $600 million of cash coming in. And as we get into the results and the earnings call, you will see number one, why people puked out the stock, knee-jerk reaction, because the revenue decline looked like they are going out of business. However, you will see that the Q4 2022 comp was an aberration, both from a normal run rate and by the fact that a lot of Q3 2022 got pushed into Q4 2022, making the comp that much higher. So when you see a quote 16% decline in revenues year on year, you don't see the sequential revenue run rate basically flat. In other words, the headline without proper analysis and understanding is much worse than it seems. Again, look at the quote, scary revenue numbers. 16% uh, down, Vans down 29, North Face down 11, Timberland 22, Dickies down 17. Of course there were sellers yesterday, but when you zoom out and look back, you say, that's what they do. They've been doing about 3 billion a quarter for the last four years, they need uh, someone to light the fire and uh, and uh, spark some new innovation. And that's what Bracken Darrell is known for. He's a marketer. As a matter of fact, one of my buddies uh, who I've been playing poker with for 15 years worked with him back when he was at P&G and had a lot of good things to say about him. So um, number one, it's fixable. Number two, buying it down 82, 83% off its all-time high more than compensates us for the waiting we will do to get a full recovery and beyond. And number three, as I always say, quote, they don't give away multi-baggers for free. If you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen. So here's the reports. Uh, he says our third quarter top line performance was disappointing. However, we're confident the actions we are implementing as part of reInvent will enable VF to stabilize and then grow revenue and improve operational performance across all brands and regions. We've already begun to see the impact of our efforts to right-size the company's cost structure and improve its inventory position. Ah, restocking period, ladies and gentlemen, resulting in stronger than, that's, that theme sounds familiar, right? Uh, stronger than expected cash flow and expanded gross margin in the quarter. This guy's been, he barely can find the coffee machine and, and gross margins are already going up in a quarter and a half. This, this quarter marked the beginning of the next phase of our transformation plan resetting the marketplace for vans, reviewing our brand portfolio and continuing to build the organization of the future. As we approach the end of the fiscal year, my confidence in BF's future is rising. Okay, so they did 3 billion bucks in top line, shift in timing of deliveries. By the way, this is interesting. The APAC region was up 26%, including Greater China up 31% percent ladies and gentlemen 31 percent this is this is a recurring theme we saw it in canada goose was up huge in china even though europe and the u.s was down similar story to vans um inventories down 17 percent relative to last year that's good they'll start the re restocking cycle soon net debt reduced by 640 million dollars already uh, uh, reinvent and improve North America, turn around vans, uh, reduce costs, strengthen the balance sheet, yada, yada, simplify streamlining processes, etc. The company reaffirmed its cash flow guidance for fiscal year 2024 of, of approximately $600 million. Now, the interesting thing here, you can see uh, nine months ended December, uh, North Face was up 4%, Dickies was up 2%, uh, EMEA was up 2%, APAC was up 5%. It's really, 
the Americas and Vans that are just got to fix those. And, and that's where he spent all of his time in the last few months. After he found the coffee machine, he parked his butt at the cafeteria at Vans and basically talked to every employee, gave out his cell phone number, hired a few, fired a few, you know, the drill. Uh, gross margins up 55 percent. Uh, uh, gr gross margins up to 55.1. That's up 20 basis points, which is good to see. Um, inventories decreased by 333 million, down 17 percent relative to last year. That's huge progress. They returned 35 million to shareholders through cash dividends in the core in fiscal year in Q3 2024. So that was kind of them. And the last thing you need to keep in mind, and these are the type of businesses we like, ladies and gentlemen, founded in 1899, not 2023, where they've got some five-year projection that you can use as kindling to start your fire in the middle of winter. This is a business that's been around for 125 years. They've bought brands. They've sold brands. They know how this thing works. They're going to fix it. They fixed it, I would imagine, 20 times before. And some companies just keep working. This is going to be one of them. It's Vans, it's North Face, it's Timberland, it's Dickies. By the time we sell this thing, when it's up three, four, five X, this brand uh, uh, suite here could be completely different. Maybe we'll only have two out of these four and we'll have three new ones for all we know. Uh, this um, uh, Bracken Darrell is a very creative guy and I think he's going to find some interesting things to do. Um, the cash went up. Their accounts receivable went down, their inventories came down, their uh, long-term debt came down. So a lot of good things happening here. Uh, cash position went up dramatically. And then you just see here the nine months ending where all the growth is, EMEA, APAC, Greater China, International, and where it's sucking wind is the Americas. So that they can fix. Uh, and uh, just like he did with Logitech. I mean, if you can, if you can make commodity <clears throat> webcams, as a matter of fact, I'm looking into a Logitech camera right now. If you can make commodity webcams, which you can buy anywhere sexy and have margins, you can certainly do it with fashion. As a matter of fact, they had, I should have included it in the article. They did this collaboration in, I guess, Paris Fashion Week with Louis Vuitton is doing a lot of clothes now, and they have... Louis Vuitton with Timberland and it was like all of these famous hip hop people and uh, you know wearing the Louis Vuitton clothes and the bags with the Timberland shoes and the Timberland shoes were super cool. Look, I bought Vans because I own the company. That was a little bit of a stretch for me. You're not going to see me wearing Timberlands anytime soon unless I get into like, you know, chopping down trees in my backyard, which is not my thing. But uh, I can see how people would want to wear the things that they're putting out, which is pretty cool. I'm just simply not cool enough to wear what they did at the Paris Fashion Show. Not even cool enough to wear Vans, let's just put it that way, but it is what it is. I had to, you know, figure it out. All right, um, all right, so here's the earnings call. <clears throat> um, he covers, the big, uh, big Delta came down to five things. Uh, all right, so here are his five excuses for the quarter. One, unse first off, he says it's, it's unacceptable, blah, blah, blah. But, Unseasonably warm weather, that's true in the U.S. That's why the Canada Goose uh, jacket sales in the U.S. were also weak, as it was North Face in the U.S. were weak. Two, difficult compare, which we covered. Three, uh, Americas, we know. Four, uh, cleaning up vans and resetting the channels. If you remember, they, they're adopting the EU platform in vans, so a little bit more hair there than they anticipated. And then they had this beautiful cyber incident like five days before Christmas, so that didn't help. Now, of note, in January, the weather got cold and North Face returned to growth across all three regions. We believe our performance is strongly held back by the operating model that we're now transitioning away from. So the commercial organization in America's platform is in place. We're confident this will translate into improved result for the brand across the rest of our brands. Um, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so now they're talking about vans. During the periods from 2015 to 2020, the brand really took off. It got energized and accepted by new groups thanks to cultural trend makers. More celebrities started to wear them than ever. They took, we took our eye off the core youth audience that had been the lifeblood of Vans. The brand had to evolve, but rather than continue to respect and serve the youth audience that had built the brand, um, we fed the trend that grew it rapidly. 
We largely withdrew marketing to the core youth and instead focused on everyone else. We extended our lineup to lower price points and value stores, and we offered more and more colors and waves, the same old things to pour more fuel onto the fire built on a trend. The trend burned out 18 months ago. The trend moved on. When a brand loses its way, the answer starts at its foundation, its purpose, and its target audience. Okay, that the reason that's so important is because guess what this thing is all about? This parabolic interest in Vans New School. It's not 46-year-old hedge fund managers wearing Vans New School, okay? It's, you know, um, high school, middle school, and grammar school girls and boys wearing these cool things. And, uh, and you know, it's a small part of their business right now, but they now got back to the basics and to that youth audience, which is loving them, okay? Um, bah, 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 bah. Okay. I'm not re yet ready to commit to when the brand will return to growth, but it will. We continue to see strong performance from newer things in the Vans portfolio, which are becoming a larger share of our business. The new school, for example, is still small, but it's growing well, especially among young girls in the U.S. I'm not pointing that style or suggest it's the turnaround shoe. There won't be a single one, as you will see. We have a cascade of new products over the next several years, but I'm encouraged by how this style is resonating with the very cohort we've lost over the recent years. We're resetting the marketplace, launch relevant new products in coming seasons. I'm energized by the progress of Vans, including the search for a new brand president. There's more to come. Okay. Timberland. Okay, so this is a Louis Vuitton Timberland collaboration. All right, let me update you on uh, reInvent, which prioritizes aggressively our four key areas we introduced last quarter. First is fix the US. Second, deliver the van's turnaround. Third, lower our cost base and force strengthen our balance sheet. So he goes through all of those updates. And they're so confident in their turnaround that they do not believe they are going to refinance the debt that comes due at the end of this year and next year. They believe they're going to simply just pay it off and that's gonna come from their free cash flow and uh, the sale of the PAX business, which is currently being marketed and is in a bidding process. And it's one of the divisions that is growing. So they should command a nice premium for that, those businesses, and they will use that to pay down the debt, which is gonna lower interest expense, which is going to fuel the fire as the restocking prices uh, process uh, kicks, cycle kicks back in and takes them out of the doldrums into the blaze of glory. All right, uh, let's see, maximize free cash flow. Yeah. Liquidity at the end of the quarter stood at 2.8 billion. And that's what I say, in turnarounds, the number one thing you're doing is solvency risk. And in the case of VF Corp, they're in pretty good stead on that front. Uh, certainly better than Cooper Standard was when we got involved with Cooper at $5.10. There was a real risk of refinancing and um, credit markets were closed in fall of 2022. But we had, you know, if they couldn't get it done themselves, we had lined up uh, people that we were going to put them in front of to get the financing done because we love the operating leverage of the business and we're excited they're going to report next week. We'll talk more about that. Um, okay, we got that. Liquidity, cost savings. So they just go through it. And if you own this, you should go through all of this. I, I highlighted and underlined the most important parts. Um, Okay, as he closes, I'm super excited about VF's future. As I said earlier, I think the steps we're taking to turn things around are happening. The implementation is real and change is happening fast internally, even though you probably can't feel it. You certainly can't see it yet in our numbers. I've said it before. We have world-class brands and amazing talent. Foundations on which to rebuild this are here and to have a great business. Now, uh, unlike all birds, <laughs> uh, bands have been around long enough that they always come back. This is from just two years ago, their most recent peak. You can see the headline here from E! News. Rihanna, Megan Fox, Kim Kardashian, Bella Hadid, uh, Sophie Turner, and more stars prove that vans are always a trend. That's from February 2022. You can see all these celebrities wearing vans and then goes on to show 
um, Olivia Rodrigo, Gwen Stefani, Kim Kardashian, Kaya Gerber, Whitney Port, and Bella Hadid also. That actually looks like, um, uh, anyway, you, you recognize the celebrities. You can click there for the source. Now, now on to Baba Earnings. Um, I would say there were three takeaways from Baba Earnings. I thought it was interesting. Lord giveth, the Lord give, taketh away. <laughs> the day before earnings, the stock's up eight bucks. <laughs> the day after earnings, the stock's down seven bucks uh, for a net gain, <laughs> which is unbelievable. Uh, but I think here's the takeaway. Number one, you got your retail trader and gambler mindset that th they pay 90% attention to price and 10% attention to value. They look at the price and they go, I can't believe the stock is down over 5%. I've had enough. I'm out. Uh, and you saw a lot of that on Twitter. Uh, then the institutional investor says, quote, but it's still higher than where it was two days ago, not the end of the world, hold. And then you get the value investor who says, I can buy this company at 2014 prices with revenues up 17x in local currency and free cash flow up 7.5x. Price is what you pay, value is what you get, adding at the margin. So that's where we are with BABA. You can see the revenues in local currency. You can see the free cash flow in uh, U.S. dollars, which is actually a bit higher than $25 billion, uh, if you add in the last quarter. And my quick take on Twitter after earnings was, number one, they generated $8 billion of free cash flow. That's the number one thing I care about in a turnaround situation is the balance sheet and the free cash flow. And that's doing just great. Number two, they increased the buyback authorization by $25 billion dollars. So now they've got 30, 35 billion. They're going to do 12 billion a year. They did 9 billion last year, uh, 9.2 actually. Taobao and Tmall revenues were up 2%. Cloud intelligence revenues were up 3%. By the way, their EBITDA was up 86% because they're firing all their non profitable customers. Very similar to PayPal, by the way. Um, and then uh, their international revenues were up 44%. AliExpress was up 60%. Revenues grew 5% overall. Now, if you read the headlines about China every day, you would think the revenue should be down 20%. And in the face of all of that, they were up 5% across very mature businesses, which they're now reinventing and, and reestablishing growth. We'll talk a little bit about that. So the quote from Eddie Wu, the CEO, our top priority is to reignite the growth of our, e, our core businesses, e-commerce and cloud computing. We will step up investment to improve users' core experiences to drive growth in Taobao and Tmall Group and strengthen market leadership in the coming year. In other words, we're going to box out those bitches at Pinduoduo. Uh, congrats on their little run. Now we're going to squash them like a little bug. Uh, we'll also focus our resources on developing public cloud products and sustaining the strong growth momentum in international commerce business. Uh, and then Morgan Stanley's take. But then again, just step back. Again, similar box to uh, VF Corp. Okay, so it's basically gone nowhere from March of 2022. And we're going to be in March of 20. So 24 months, it's been sideways with no progress, trading in this box, building a base. Okay, and, um, you know, just like it's done two times before, it goes through these periods of two, two and a half years of sideways consolidation. And then it goes straight up. And um, and I think we're there. So it's like, I don't think they're going to find any more sellers. I think Xi has realized he's at an acute point. Now he's telling people that if you short stocks in China, we're going to take you out back and shoot you. Uh, you know, we're going to we're going to use the state funds to uh, buy Chinese ETFs to try to goose the stock. So, you know, in the short term, people are selling into that. They're like sold to you, Xi. You've been, a, you know, uh, not the best leadership. Uh, uh, for the last few years. So you want to buy stocks, here you go, have at it. And then they'll, they'll absorb all that supply and then we'll be off to the races. And uh, uh, we'll get back to a normalized multiple of 20, 25 times on nine bucks. And uh, you have a, nice, uh, have a nice day, we're going to Sizzler. So uh, here, here are some of the highlights, okay? First off, quote, we delivered a solid quarter as, as we are executing on our focus strategies across organizations, our top priority is to re reignite the growth of our core business. Okay, we went through that. 5% growth, 25 billion share repurchase authorization, um, $8 billion of free cash flow. Uh, so what was the problem? The problem was 
uh, even though they beat on the bottom line, they're, they're reinvesting some profits to uh, make sure they box out competition. International grew huge. AliExpress grew huge. Trindall did well. Double digit order growth. Uh, Kai now grew. That's going to be sold or spun. I did like, we're going to cover, I like the fact he explained why they're less optimistic to sell or spin because it's the same reason they, they doubled their or tripled their buyback authorization. They want to buy low and sell high. Unlike a lot of U.S. CEOs, candidly, who like to sell high and buy low, um, you rarely see huge buybacks in the hole in the U.S. And I'm liking that we're seeing nice buybacks in the hole in China. And I hope we see a lot of selling at $300 uh, where they're selling stock versus buying stock and vice versa. So they bought back $3 billion last quarter, $9.5 billion for the year. Um, you can see by, by division, the growth, every single division is up. Okay. I mean, it just doesn't get any better than that. Uh, cloud intelligence, EBITDA profitability is now up 86%. That's huge. Um, so look, a lot of good stuff and they cut 20,000, uh, they cut, uh, 5,000 more employees. So I think they've cut a total of 20,000 now. Um, Okay, so let's cover a couple of the key things from the conference call. I don't want to get spend too much time where we're 46 minutes in. We got a lot of ask me anything questions. Uh, but he goes through how he's going to turn it around. That's great. Um, okay, now he looking backwards, they've had about a 3% net reduction in share count. Um, prospectively, He's expecting to continue that. So it'll be a 3% reduction a year over the next three years. So let's call it, they'll take in 10% of the stock. And then you add the dividend yield, uh, <clears throat> which is about 1.4%. So you're at 4.4% shareholder yield from dividends and buybacks. And as he puts it, which I thought was a brilliant way uh, to put it, is... Uh, he says you're basically he says which is right in line with the 10-year yield so if you buy Alibaba stock it's like you bought a 10-year treasury bond with the upside of stock price appreciation so that's the math we're looking at and I think that's a really smart way to think about it and what he's basically saying there is we're safer than a treasury and if you look at their balance sheet and they're still having revenue growth on top of their balance sheet and they're going to as the markets come back liquefy some of these non-core assets that you're getting zero credit for that are worth billions upon billions of dollars, about 60 billion in non-core, um, it's exciting times, okay? Um, so that's that. They talked about return on invested capital, getting back to double digits, how they're gonna do it, et cetera. Now, let's move on to how the weighing machine works. Here's a similar take to what we've been saying and repeating since day one. Neither I nor this author are brilliant as it relates to the following assessment, but we are smart enough to simply copy the success, the investing framework of the masters, Ben Graham, David Dodd, Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger, etc. Remember, you don't have to be original to be creative. This excerpt is from Albert Bridge Capital, also quoting Ben Graham via one of our loyal podcast listeners, thanks to Matt. But uh, by the way, shout out to NYU. I know we've got like the whole uh, NYU wrestling team listening to the podcast because of Matt. And we met some great people because of that. Um, uh, so, so anyway, so here's the, uh, what, what I'm quoting here. Uh, but I am as convinced as ever that eventually it is the fundamentals that matter. Eventually the market is a weighing machine. If you want some evidence, even from the most iconic, well-followed index heavy retail engaged pod own successful companies. It is still eventually all about the fundies. So let's take some of the winners as an example. And by winners, I mean game changing, world dominating winners. You've surely noticed what has happened to NVIDIA lately. We used to just call these winners Fangs and then Fang S and then Famang. But NVIDIA has insisted on joining the league table, now has a $1.7 trillion market cap. And in the last five years, the stock is up about 1700%. Guess what? else is up about 1700% NVIDIA's earnings estimates. How about Facebook, AKA Meta, which goes through periods of hatred and love with equal vigor. Over the last seven years, it has bounced around a lot, but still has generated nearly 260% return. 
returns, and forward earnings projections, they're up 280%. We can stretch things further back and look at Google over the past 14 years, earnings up 885%, stock up 980%, or Amazon during the same period, earnings up 2,500%, stock up about 2,800%. Or we can go way back and analyze Microsoft over the past 22 years. Forward earnings projections have increased from 0.93 uh, or 93 cents in February of 2022 to $11.57 today. That's nearly 1150%. The stock is up just over 1200%. And finally, one of my favorite former CEOs, uh, Reed Hastings. We have good old Netflix. About 18 years ago, analysts were forecasting that NVIDIA would gener uh, Netflix would generate 11 cents of earnings in the coming year. Here in 2024, they are forecasting a whopping $17 of earnings in the coming year. That's a whopping EPS increase of 14,889%. And how about the stock? Well, it's up a whopping 14,882%. Uncanny. Well, that's how it works, ladies and gentlemen. It always sinks up sooner or later. Let me get back to quoting. Uh, fundamentals matter, sports fans, fundamentals matter. Admittedly, some of these examples are very long-term, but even when we self-select with some of the biggest, most exciting long-term winners out there and ignore the losers, of which there are many, it still appears it is the fundamentals that matter most. Okay, end quote. So you can see all these different examples, six examples, what was the price and what was the earnings when he starts counting and what is the price and the earnings, and both have grown pretty much about the same. Now, if you did that on any year, I'm sure there would be a vast divergence between price and earnings, okay? But over time, they eventually catch up. Some, some catch up on 22 years, some catch up on three years, some catch up on five years. While this type of analysis is not perfect, it's roughly right. And to make a lot of money in this business, you need only be roughly right. Here's one to add to the list. Alibaba, okay? Uh, in, uh, February 7, 2015, the forward earnings EPS estimates were $2.60. The share price was $87.87. Today, the forward earnings are $9.64. The share price is $73.45. So earnings up 3.7x or forward estimates up 3.7x. Implied fair value is... $325. The deficit we are due at current levels is 251 extra dollars. And whether that comes in 24 months or 48 months is immaterial. The key is sooner or later that will sink up. The commonality you'll find among the six examples the author listed above and the one I listed afterward is that there is no way to tell when the fundamentals line up with price. The key is to understand and know that sooner or later they will adjusted for multiples and growth rate, etc. While no one talk what no one talks about is what you have to hold through to get the big results. In his first example of Nvidia, how many of you would have held through the 71% crash in 2002? Very looks very easy on the chart. Guaranteed most of you would have sold out and missed all of this upside. In his second example of Meta, how many of you would have held through the 43% crash in 2018, or the 77% crash in 2022. <clears throat> in his third example of Amazon, how many of you would have held through three 40% crashes and the 60% crash in 2022 during his measurement period? In his fifth example of Google, how many of you would have held through the 50% crash in 2022? In his sixth example of Microsoft, how many of you would have held through the 60% crash in 2008 and the 43% crash in 2022? My goodness, that would have made the um, restricted list at all the big brokerages, all of your financial advisors with their pretty little business cards that say Morgan Stanley and Wells Fargo and all that stuff, they wouldn't have even been allowed to buy it for you in the hole because their big boss would have said, that's too risky. And uh, what they would have realized is that price going down doesn't add risk. It actually takes risk out when you're dealing with a high quality cash generative business. And that's what gives us our edge in the marketplace. The answer is, okay, so 
in the sixth example, how many would you, oh, in the sixth example of Netflix, how many of you would have held through the 60% crash in 2008, the 85% crash in 2012, and the 80% crash in 2022? My goodness, why, how did I miss buying Netflix down 80%? I love buying businesses, good businesses down 80%. I should just screen for businesses down 80%. Uh, but the, if the answer is I would, then you're probably wealthy and you're likely already a client. If the answer is no, be open to the possibility that you're selling at the wrong time yet again. You probably fall into the emotional group of, quote, after Baba doubles, I'll become a client. <laughs> there will always be opportunities. But while you wait for that one, you've missed a bunch already, both stock and accompanying options overlays that have already been well more than doubles. Is PayPal the next one with a, quote, price deficit relative to intrinsic value? Well, let's take a look at the measurement using the author's formula. The forward earnings estimates February 7, 2016 were $1.15. The stock was at $38.09. Today, the forward estimates are $5.10, and the stock price is 61. Actually, it's 55 today or 57 or whatever the hell it is. Anyway, that's 4.43x on the earnings, implies fair value of 168.92. The deficit due to us is over 105 more dollars, which I think we're going to have over the next 24 to 36 months plus. Sandbagger and Chief, after Alex Chris, the new CEO of PayPal, put the investment community on notice that he would, quote, shock the world with his new initiatives on January 26 and landed an air ball or brick, as they say, uh, not because it lacked substance, but because it was a pre-recorded message that would take time to show results, he decided he would take a different tact with earnings. In golf, there are a group of, quote, unscrupulous players that never record low scores for their handicaps, so they always have a high handicap and can miraculously win money anytime they gamble on the course. This is because the other player has to give them strokes. Well, that's what we just saw from the new CEO, Andrew Chris, with his forward guidance. After beating on every single metric by a long shot and exceeding expectations for Q4, he decided to take the fiscal year bottom line guide down to $5.10 so he can crush every quarter moving forward. The antithesis of, quote, shock the world. He figured out the secret to happiness, both in Wall Street and in life, is low expectations. And now he will crush it moving forward. Under promise and over deliver to the extreme. So here are the results. Revenues increased 9% year on year uh, for the quarter. For the year, increased 8%. He says, quote, I'm pleased with our better than expected fourth quarter results, which are a testament to the incredible work of the PayPal team and their strong commitment to delivering more value to our customers each day. We're driving significant transformation across our company and are committed to making the necessary changes to our business to drive profitable growth for the years ahead. We've added key talent to our leadership, accelerated innovation, velocity, and impact, and taken action to realize cost savings that we're reinvesting in our most important initiatives. 2024 is a year very focused on execution to position PayPal for long-term success. So net revenue is up 9%. Gap operating income increased 39%. Non-gap 11%. Gap operating margins increased 486 basis points. Non-gap 39 basis points. Uh, gap EPS increased 61%. Non-gap 19%. Financial results as we covered. Uh, operating results, total payment volume increased 15% for the year, 13%. For the quarter, transactions increased 13%. For the year, 12%. Uh, transactions for active account on a trailing 12-month basis increased 14%. Active accounts decreased 426. Analysts thought this was a bad thing, but he told you last quarter he's going to fire all the clients that don't make them any money which means they need less overhead, which means, quote, profitable growth. I hope this number goes down to 400 million so we can really make some money. Uh, and that's the name of the game. So free cash flow, uh, $2.5 billion, $4.2 billion for fiscal year 2023. 
Uh, they bought back five billion of shares. They're going to do the same thing next year, and so on and so forth. Um, now, here was the surprise. This is the WTF question mark. <laughs> it's if everything is going up, revenues, margins, free cash flow, uh, the whole thing. Why would your bottom line be flat year on year at five dollars and ten cents? And there's only one reason. He realized, quote unquote, setting up people to shock the world is amateur hour. What you need to do is tell people it's going to be terrible. And then when it's great, people can't believe how unbelievable it is. And your stock doubles. So that's exactly what he's done. He's taken the bar way, way down uh, and he's going to crush it. My guess it'll come in 625 next year and that's going to blow the doors off and everyone's going to be through the race. I mean, look at the year on year growth of every single metric, whether it's revenues, transaction margin, operating income, operating margin, effective tax rate, earnings per diluted share. Uh, it's, it's just mind boggling. Every single metric is just through the roof and the guy guides flat. Uh, this is a guy who wants to get a ton of options low and sell them very, very high. Uh, it's unequivocal. So, um, all right, so you can go through these metrics. I, I mean, the, the key is margins are improving, revenues are improving, earnings are improving, uh, active uh, accounts, uh, payment transactions are improving, free cash flow is improving, and the only thing that's not is guidance, which is just complete sandbagger squared. Uh, you watch, we're going to do over six dollars uh, uh, per share in earnings in 2020 in the, in the next year, and uh, and that's going to take the stock up meaningfully and re-rate the multiple and so on and so forth. So you can go through all these things. Um, he goes through his five point plan, etc., five principles, yada yada. The key is, all I need to see is his numbers. They're working. He's going to continue to execute. He put out his plan to shock the world. That actually will shock the world. Uh, and it could it could shock the world to the, to the tune of $7 a share, by the way. Uh, that would really shock the world. And then as far as Disney goes, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this. At the end of the day, we were right. Uh, no one wanted it at $80. Everyone wants it at $113. They're going to want it a lot more at $175 in the next two or three years probably back off now because people are chasing up, chasing it up, but they're going to, they're doing everything they said they're going to do. First, they said they were going to cut $5 billion in cost. Now, then they said, wait, we already got there. We're going to do seven and a half billion. Now they're, now they're knocking on the door of seven and a half. They're like, yeah, we're probably going to do more than seven and a half billion. Oh, and by the way, our free cash flow is going to be much higher than it was even pre pandemic. And it's going to happen quickly. They're doing all these partnerships because of value act with the tier pricing. If you saw New York times is going through the roof because Value Act helped them with their tier pricing. New York Times was left for dead business. Uh, Value Act came in as an activist, taught them how to do the business, and they went through the races. Same thing with Spotify, the tier pricing. They're fixing everything for Disney. You're seeing those announcements this week. They did that investment in the gaming thing, which kids love. That'll be good. They'll put all Disney characters in there. We'll be off to the races. And, uh, and all the metrics are going up. They're hitting on all cylinders, and this one's just getting started. So <clears throat> is this one you want to trim because... You want me to sell out of Disney because we're going to get a 5 to 7% pullback in the market and then Disney runs to 140 over the next two years and we don't have any stock because we made $2 selling a call? The answer is no. You got to just suck up a little short-term volatility. Maybe we'll get a couple tactical shorts on, but these things aren't even near fair, fair value yet and we're just getting started, which, which is super exciting on all these fronts. All right, Baxter, they beat earnings. We're not going to spend a lot of time. As I said, we'd like to spend time on the, the ones that aren't working yet. And, uh, and the ones that are working, they take care of themselves. But the free cash flow is growing. They're executing on all cylinders. The stock was up. Uh, top 30 weights of the tech index. Actually, they've come down in the last 60 days. Uh, the earnings have come down. Cumulative earnings down 2.04%. So that's why I wouldn't be chasing these big names up so much. I think there's so many other things to do. And if you look under the surface, you'll see them. Uh, communication services, same story, down 3% in the last 60 days. Earnings overall are coming in, starting to really accelerate uh, halfway through the earnings season. Estimates were plus 1%. We're at plus 1.6 now. Um, a lot of that drag was from banks related to these new fees that they have to pay. Uh, I don't have it in front of me, but there's some new regulatory thing that really hurt earnings that kicked in actually last quarter. Maybe I'll cover it next week in more detail. But um, even so, overall, big tech uh, came to the rescue. And I think you're going to see more and more companies 
um, continue to deliver as we get through the earnings season. And the surprise is going to be the margin expansion that no one's expecting. And you're seeing estimates uh, hold up just fine around that 243, 245 range. As it relates to uh, economic data, I mean, the only thing I could see here, initial jobless claims came in a little lighter than expected, but they were still strong. Uh, look, the economy's doing well. I mean, there's nothing more you can say to that. So if it's three cuts versus six cuts, it's perfectly fine. The point that I've been making since day one is the sooner they start, the less cuts they're going to have. I mean, if they started in January, they could probably get away with one or two cuts and be done uh, and keep a normalized cycle. They'll wait till March or May. They'll probably have to do two, three, or four, uh, but that's quite all right. So earnings across the board have generally been good. Um, and I think we're ready for the Ask Me Anything question. So for those of you normal listeners, we're done. Hour all set. Those of you who want to stick around to the Ask Me Anything questions, we're getting started now. Christopher Fies says, thoughts on KRC, Class A, Office re Retracing Recent Gains, California Risk, Owns Quality Buildings, Debt is Manageable, blah, blah, blah. Uh, we played the double. We made a double plus and then with the options a lot more on Vornado last year. You all remember. Um, we're not really excited yet. These have to come back a lot for us to get interested again. Um Same thing with Intel, we made a double. We'd, we'd have to see that get back into the low 30s if we were gonna add back the uh, two thirds that we took off uh, at a double. Um, but we still have the third, so we're, we're perfectly fine with that. KRC, I don't even know what the hell, oh, Kilroy. Okay. Let's pull it up here. KRC. Uh, it's down to 35. I mean, the problem, the reason Vornado was so easy for us is because I know the buildings and I know they're the top quality. I mean, here you have, stop with all this sustainable. How many times are you going to say the word sustainable and you're just tell me what buildings you own? Uh, life science, that's good. Technology engineering and business service companies. Decades, mixed use properties, 14 million, primary office and life science space, 92% occupied, 90. Yeah, I just really want to know if this is A, B, or C class properties. So, uh, uh, let's just take a look at some of the financials real quick. I, I don't know these buildings, so I, I really can't give you great confidence in this. Let me just see. Cash flow negative. I don't know. I, I, I don't really want to play in office unless it's the best of the best. It's got to be Boston Properties or Renato. I know those groups. That is just a trade. It's probably going to work for you. I understand why you submitted it, and I think it'll probably work. But it's a, the risk reward. I mean, if you're right, you're going to make a double. There's so many safer, more exciting things you can make a double in. So don't get caught up. Uh, what are your thoughts on Nike? I know that we done this before well my thoughts haven't changed <laughs> i like it i don't own it um i think 
you're fine for the long term with Nike here. Um, Yeah, I mean, the big risk with the overhang on Nike right now is China. And of course, I'd be very nervous that Vans is going to steal all their market share. So you do have to watch out for Vans taking over Nike. But uh, look, this is a great business. I think, you're, you know, the multiple is a little bit rich relative to the growth rate. So that's not that's probably why we don't own it. Um, I think there are better things to do, but I don't think you'll get hurt with that. So uh, again, this is all opinion and not advice. Go to hedgefundtips.com and read the terms. Ulta, this is a good business too. Um, yeah, I mean, I just don't think this is coming enough for me to get excited about it. It's barely off its highs, so. Yeah, I think it's fine. I don't think the cash flows. Well, that's not that's not Ulta. Okay, there we go. Yeah, I would just. I mean, for Ulta, I would just like to see it pull back more. And with businesses like that, you usually don't get it. So I just, I wait. I just wait. You know, a lot of good pitches. This is a good pitch. Good business it's not a great pitch i just i'd like to see both of those cheaper great businesses and you don't always get those opportunities lynn hart uh looking for value in cabo a few percentage points in dividend while you wait I was wondering your thoughts yeah these cable companies i'm ah I, I keep looking at them too and i continue to do nothing um Okay, so cable one, look out here, they're generating a lot of cash. Uh, interim video, voice services. Da -da -da -da. They probably, let's see. Let me just see something here. Look, I, I've been looking at this one. And I don't know why I keep saying no. Let me just see. Right, so the revenues are flat the last three years. EBITDA's almost halved. Earnings are collapsing. Let's see what their balance sheet looks like. I think this is where you're going to have your problem. Two hundred thirty million and nine million of cash. Three point six billion in debt. How about cash flow? Pretty decent. Steady. Um, boy, you know, let me ask this question. Lynn Hart, why do the women always have the best ideas? Uh, it's Kayla and Lynn. This one's gonna take some time to recover and it's not without risk because they are in a secularly declining business, just like Charter. Um, Uh, 
Uh, I have to spend more time on this. I don't hate this idea. I, I got to say, Lynn, I, I just have to better understand what this business can look like because let's assume the bundle goes away completely and the only money they're making is on the pipes. And then the question is, can the pipes be disrupted by a Starlink or something else uh, like a Starlink? Is the satellite good enough or reliable enough? And are they in areas where there's enough modes? Don't forget, a lot of that Inflation Reduction Act is to give uh, people in rural areas free cable. So these are the type of companies that can benefit from that. Um, so I would go listen to the last eight conference calls, read the annual reports, and just at least get the rosy side from management on what do they see is going to stop the deterioration trend. And if you can get comfortable that it's a plausible outlook, uh, I think the margin of safety is pretty decent on this one, uh, but you got more work to do. But I, I, think, your, I think your thought process is really good. Uh, Steve Taylor on Vodafone. All right. Uh, Vodafone has been doing nothing for. Maybe we should just buy Cabo right away because it's down 82 <laughs> percent or it looks like it, it's down 82 percent. That seems to be the magic number. All right. Um, Vodafone. This is another kind of sleepy dead business. I mean, the stock has done nothing for 20 years. Uh, kind of looks like Microsoft before it took off, but um, I don't know what the catalyst would be for this thing to take off, to be honest with you. I think this is kind of a flat utility with a dividend yield of double digits. Uh, their cash flow has basically been flat to declining for 20 years. Their revenues have been flat to declining for 20 years. And the stock price has been flat to declining for 20 years. So um, it's just a low quality business. Um, 300 million mobile customers. They're selling a Spanish division. And then they're going to reinvest that money in faster growth markets. Ah. Uh, you know, this one's interesting because stock price might decline a little bit, but if you're getting a 10% dividend per year, it looks like they've got the cash flow coverage. How is their debt looking? Yeah, that might be a problem. Let me take a look at their debt. I've looked at this one a million times too. I've not done anything with it because there are better, higher and better uses, but... Um, $43 billion of debt. That's going to be an issue as far as the refinancing, but they are generating a boatload of cash. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think this is another similar situation. I think it's better than buying a treasury because you could have a double in the stock, you're getting 10% a year. So even if it dropped down to six bucks in the short term before it stabilizes, I, I, I think it's kind of interesting, Steve. I'd have to do more work on it, but I think, I think your thought process is good. Uh, TJ asks about Atos SE. Never heard of it, but let's pull it up. A-T-O-S. All right, Atos, 
think I'm going to be able to pull it up here because it's French. No. Okay. So. Yeah, so the stock's down from 128 bucks down to two bucks just like it did in the last tech rack. Um, revenues have gone nowhere. EBIT's okay. Earnings have been negative. Cash flow. Free cash flow negative. I don't like that. Let's take a look at operating cash flow. Yeah, the, the free cash flow and operating cash flow have been declining. Um, what's the balance sheet look like? 2.6 billion liabilities. 2.6 billion income statement. I mean, this just looks like a secularly declining business, TJ, but um, Yeah, I mean, you're talking about um, they've got to sell off a part to pay down the debt and it's not going fast enough. I wouldn't get to, TJ, there, there are better things to do. I, it might work and I like the creativity, but I think there, there are better ways to play. Um, remember, the secret to success in this business is doing less, not doing more. It, it's the opposite of any other endeavor in life. Yum China from John Hughes. I like this one, um, but I've got enough China exposure with Baba. So uh, let's just uh, pull it up really quickly for you. Yeah, I mean, I think it's fine. It, it, it'll go when the rest of China goes. Um, and it looks like it's already starting a little bit. So, yeah, I think that's fine. John, good job. Who else? Uh, Kayla, what'd you bring me? Charter. Oh, gosh. Lynn and, uh, and Kayla bringing me two great ones. Uh show let me try to share thank you for that charter I mean, this is the broadband play. Uh, I think your analysis here, Kayla, is pretty spot on. It's going to take a while. I do think this will ultimately recover. Um, God, it does look like it's dying, though. This chart is a little scary. I'm not a big chart person, but I don't know. <laughs> I just don't problem with this one is, and with the cable one is, I can't clearly envision what the business is going to look like in five years. 
And for that reason, I haven't taken advantage of the cheap prices. Um, I think there's too much change going on that I can't really understand in these businesses as well as I feel I can in the businesses we own. Um, but on the flip side, there's probably a decent enough margin of safety if it's a, like a 5% position in the portfolio. Uh, you're probably okay, but I, I wouldn't lean into this one because I think it's going to take longer than you think. It's going to be bumpier than you think. And I think the upside is more limited than you think. Um, so for those reasons, I'd probably pass, even though I like the idea and it's probably going to work for you. Sam R. Ah, this is a good question. Knowing what you've known about Alibaba in terms of investing in a low sentiment political stock, would you do the same again if a similar opportunity arose in a different country? 100% Sam. Uh, the framework that I used to invest in Alibaba is the same framework that's made me exceptionally a tremendous amount of uh, living in this business over a long period of time. And I would actually, like Munger said, invert. So people say, why don't you own any Bitcoin? And I say, well, number one, it has no yield. It's a non-productive asset. Uh, and number three, the most important thing is, is if I was shown a thousand different investments with the same characteristics as Bitcoin and asked to invest in them, un unequivocally, 999 of those 1,000 would go to zero. And probably there have been a thousand uh, with the same characteristics that have gone to zero. And the 999 that fail and wipe out people's savings, they don't write books about. The one that works is the one that gets all the attention. So, so far it's worked. It looks like it'll continue to work, um, but it's not for me. As it relates to Alibaba, um, that same framework and context and measurement that I use to enter Alibaba has made me tons and tons and tons of money over many, many different positions over my career. So no, I wouldn't change the framework at all. I would do it 100% all over again. And that's the reason that we own, uh, while it's a concentrated book of eight to 12 companies at any one point in time, it's why we don't own a concentrated book of one or two companies is because there are always things that you don't know that you don't know. If I was politically handicapping, which is, does not come into my investing framework, what a human being would do and the actions that would, they would take that would be in their interest, I would be wrong because he's taken many, many actions that were against his self-interest in the short term, ultimately to be pushed to the point, which is where I believe we are now, that he'll be forced to take the correct actions, which are going to unleash a monster slingshot of Chinese stocks and companies that took probably 12 months longer than it needed to take. And it's been dead money for 24 months. And uh, but we're going to make up for it on the IRR when it finally breaks out and takes off. So um, 100 percent, I would do that. <laughs> that's that's what that's what built my career. I do it over and over. So so the opposite is true. A thousand businesses with those characteristics, 999 are going to make money and one are going to lose uh, or take longer than you expect. I would do that all day long over and over and over. Can will have it works. Um, Unity Software, Frank Brown. All right. Okay, so this is down a lot from 210 to 30. What do they do? Greedy content platform, blah, blah, blah. Revenues are going up a lot. So are losses. Uh, turning cash flow positive. Yeah, this is more like a startup valuation where you're betting that all the losses are going to turn into profits. This is not what I do. I, I'd have to really understand the software and why they have such a competitive moat that no one's ever going to destroy it. Because what the market is telling me right now is they have no moat. 
and uh, no unique selling proposition. Uh, but I could be wrong. So I'd have to dig in more work, understand the software better. Um, this is largely the why, reason why Buffett has ignored most software, uh, uh, not most all software, but certainly most tech opportunities because it changes so quickly. Their um, unlimited free money for cost of acquisition, which drew their revenues, grew their revenues, uh, is no longer in existence. So um, I'd be skeptical on this one, but if you can understand why revenues are going to keep growing and how they get to continued profitability, then you might have a multi-bagger. Uh, for me, I, it doesn't pass enough filters for me to spend the time on it, but thank you for sending it. Brett Jennings, uh, thoughts on Ecolabs. It's already recovered half of its loss, so right there. Uh, ECI. Eco Labs is basically a flat. Revenues. Flat cash flow. Develops the markets chemical services plant pest elimination, sanitizer and maintenance. Revenues have been super flat for a decade. Same with earnings. Same with cash flow. Free cash flow. I mean, I think it's a fine, boring business that's not really growing and the stock is kind of reflecting that. Um, I think there are better things to do with your money. I think it's a slow grower and it'll slowly grind high over, higher over time. Um, I think at, the, at 140, 150, very interesting or certainly a lot more interesting at these levels. Maybe you get a 25% gain over the next year and a half. So um, it's not bad. Thank you for sending it in. Drew Byrne, uh, FMC. Uh, Drew, you are not a woman, but I like this idea a lot. Um, it's an ag play. It's down quite a bit. Probably a little bit more pain. and probably have a year of bottoming here between 50 and 60. They'll drop it into the 40s just to make you uh, soil yourself. But uh, over time, I think this will recover and be a good business for you. Um, cash flow is growing. Revenues are okay. Yeah, it's a steady grower. It's just the um, this type of business providing stuff to growers. Same with SMG, Scott's Miracle Grow. They they're left for dead, and they always come back. And uh, that's another one we got to spend some time on. Scott's Miracle Grow. Um, same with even if you look at Mosaic. Yeah, Mosaic, I wouldn't buy here. But I, I like FMC, Drew, can tell uh, you've been a consistent supporter for three years now and you've learned a lot because I think that's going to be a winner for you. Divas Lung Lang asks, so it gives me all this inflation stuff. I said, so my question is, why are Chinese equities such as Baba worthy of a buy if China is suffering from deflation? Because the point is they've been suffering from deflation for 24 months. And the government has finally figured out in the last week or so they have to do something about it. And historically, they always have, but only after they've exhausted all other possibilities. 
And uh, I think that's where they are right now. And uh, you're seeing them do a bunch of piecemeal stuff, but now they're getting to the point of doing aggressive stuff. They basically backstop the stock market at these levels and, uh, and you have only upside. So I do think you're gonna see some reacceleration. And when you look at enough companies as I do and see their China sales reaccelerating at a massive scale, it tells me things are coming back. And, um, and that's why I would. Sandeep says, given the guidance, flat earnings on the latest, latest, latest call, I wonder if there's any benefit to investing in PayPal or buying long dated calls. Uh, yeah, we bought a ton of, Ali, we bought a ton more of PayPal today. Tim Crowen, Tom, in a prior podcast, you said CPS earnings this quarter might be slightly disappointing due to industry KPIs. Tim, I've never said that. <laughs> I don't even, like the word KPI, I don't think has ever crossed my lips in my existence. But, uh, and let's see, uh, its largest clients, GM and Ford, have reported stunning results. And Nike partnership, not in your original thesis extension, was recently announced. Management is track record in under promise over deliver. Therefore, good results shouldn't be expected, don't you think? Love to share your knowledge. Well, Tim, I would ask you two things. Number one, I do think earnings are going to be good for Cooper Standard. But number two, you don't know how the stock is going to react. They can have great earnings and the stock could go down because someone gets out of the stock. If you're basing your investment decisions on what they report in seven days, you're going to be disappointed. Or they could report in line with what we saw from Ford and GM and knock the lights out and uh, and the stock goes up five or 10 bucks. But that's not why or how you want to own it. You, you know, we own this thing for two or three years because we think that it can get back to a normalized five to eight dollars a share in earnings, maybe more with some of these kickers in it. Um, and we want to be there to benefit. And the only question is going to be what's going to be the multiple at the time that we get credit for five or seven or eight dollars of earnings. Will it be a trough multiple of 10 times, a peak multiple of 20 times? I don't know. We'll see when we get there. But as far as what they report next week or, or four months from now, I could care less. I know what the trajectory is. I know where we are in the cycle. I know why I got in. I know what I'm getting out. And it has nothing to do with the next three weeks. So uh, if it makes you feel better that you might wake up in a week to good news, great. You probably will. Um, I wouldn't expect uh, earnings to be disappointing. I'm not sure where you saw that, but um, um, no, I, I generally pretty sanguine on the outlook. Um, but in the scheme of things, could care less. I, I hope it, it's surprisingly terrible and I can pick up a bunch at $12 for newer accounts, but uh, I wouldn't count on that. Wolfram Lucher, thanks for all the great work. Um, okay, so he's talking about Tom Lee sees a correction of about 7% for the S&P likely for February to April of this year or further gains. Do you share this view? And if so, what do you expect in terms of impact on the small caps? Would you expect a rotation from small, large and mega caps into small and mid caps? Or do you expect the IDM to retrace down together? Look, if the market goes down 5 or 7%, everything will go down with it. Maybe small caps will go down more. I don't really have a view. I think I've covered enough of that this week. Like if we push a lot higher, maybe I'll put on some tactical shorts. Otherwise, we're just going to ride it out. It's temporary. It's going to be a high single digit, low double digit year. Uh, the companies we own, we think will do a tremendous amount better than that. And um, we don't really worry about short term volatility. And we've attracted the right type of partners who share that view or they wouldn't have made it through the process to become clients. So. Um, Generally, look, we're not going to keep going straight up forever. So yes, I, I do think we'll get a pullback and I do think it'll be less than 10%, somewhere between three and 10%. Probably if we move up another couple of percent, it should be five to 7%. Um, and it should come, you know, somewhere mid-February through April period. But again, what do you what do you want to sell out that's not yet at full value? Um, you know, and then try to get back in or do tactical shorts. I mean, there are a lot of things to do and we'll keep a close eye on it. And that's probably gonna come, except if everyone's looking for it, probably the max pain would either be higher or it would be grinding sideways to chew up all of the op option premium that's gonna be sold and bought in anticipation of it. So the maximum pain to, to maximum 
effery, as I like to say, would be actually just grinding sideways and chopping the hell out of everyone and, uh, and let, l allowing all the premium to expire worthless. Um, that's probably the max pain at this point. Uh, and it would just grind people to death. But um, that's not what we do here. We buy quality businesses with huge margin of safety and uh, uh, we wait for them to reach fair value and uh, then fully valued. And when everyone wants them, we help them out and lay it off. So we'll continue to do that. Why? Because it works. And uh, with that said, we're going to close out for this week. We'll be back next week, same time, same place. In the meantime, make it a great one. Bye for now.